Good morning. Uh, normally, I would be welcoming you over there at the door and shaking your hand, welcoming you to Chapel Sabbath School. Uh, the last time we were able to attend a church service, it was up at uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth Philham Church, and everybody was meeting. That was the last time we were all together. And even then, they weren't shaking hands. They were doing a namasta. So let me do a namasta for you and welcome you to Chapel Sabbath School. Now, we don't have a song service this morning, but I have asked my Montana grandchildren, Peter and Sylvie, who live up there with their parents, our daughter Amy and Matt, uh, to lead the opening song for us. So, uh, they will lead the opening song. If you haven't heard this before and would like to sing along, it is number 580 in your church hymnal. So here are Peter and Sylvie leading our opening song. Thank you, Peter and Sylvie. It is only right if we were going to have our Montana grandchildren have the song service, or at least the opening song, we should have our Washington grandchildren have the scripture. So coming to us from Walla Walla, Washington, is Audrey, who is in the fifth grade up there, and Lucy, who's in the first grade. And I didn't tell you, Peter's in the first grade, and, and Sylvie is in kindergarten and they're all learning at home nowadays as most kids are but Audrey and Lucy will be having our scripture Audrey will read from Psalm 91 and Lucy will sign it for those of us who are hearing impaired and no sign language so here are Audrey and Lucy with our scripture for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me, therefore, I will deliver him. Psalm 91, 11 to 14. Okay, again, we want to welcome you and tell you right off that this is weird. Uh, normally, I'm looking at a bunch of smiling faces, and right now I'm looking at a bunch of chairs that have no expressions on their face. But we're glad that you are tuning in, and normally we would welcome our visitors and ask where they're from. And we assume some of you are watching right now and are visitors. And we would ask you to, uh, to continue to tune in to the Chapel Sabbath School at 1030 on Sabbath morning and uh, be blessed by that. And then once we begin moving in here and meeting again, I uh, ask for you to come and visit with us on 1015 on Sabbath morning. These are unusual times, the most unusual times in my life. 
Churches are closed. Schools are closed. Fitness centers are closed. Bookstores are closed. Beauty and barber shops are closed. Notice. However, liquor stores are open because they are considered essential. Yes, these are unusual times, and unusual times usually can provoke unusual dreams. I had an unusual dream the other night. Sharon and I were headed out to East Texas to look at the blue bonnets, and we stopped at a gas station, and I found myself in the restroom at the sink, and I was scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing my hands. And then a man came up right next to me, shoulder to shoulder, got some soap, and started rubbing his hands. And now there were the two of us rubbing our hands. And I said, sir, don't you know about social distancing? And he said, but I've got to wash my hands. And then on the other side, another man appeared, got some soap, and started rubbing his hands. Now there's the three of us over the sink, rubbing our hands, scrubbing and scrubbing. And I said, what about social distancing? And he said, but I've got to wash my hands. And then I woke up thinking, this is so weird. Only in times like this would I have a weird dream like that. And it's probably good to keep a sense of humor during this time. Our son-in-law, Matt, sent us a picture, a picture of a mask. And on the front of the mask, the Dallas Cowboy logo. And underneath the picture, a caption, wear this and you won't catch anything. Now, during this time, in all seriousness, there's been a lot of loss and sorrow, loss of life, loss of jobs, disappointment for events that people have been looking forward to. Millions of people have gone through disappointments during this time. Our family did. Uh, my uncle Earl is a veteran of World War II, a longtime pastor in Ohio and Michigan. He was a pastor up there for over 50 years. And recently, several weeks ago, it was his 94th birthday. And it just so happened that his 94th birthday coincided with the first baseball game to be played in the new ballpark up in Arlington. And so we all got tickets to go up to celebrate his birthday in this historic time for the ballpark in Arlington, for the Rangers. And of course, there was no game. And there hasn't been a game since. And who knows when there's going to be a game. A time of real disappointment. My wife Sharon was in HEB the other day. And there was a clerk there checking her out. And the young lady said that she's a senior in Cleburne High School. Looking forward to their class trip, their class had raised money to go to Disney World to celebrate their senior year. Uh, there was no trip to Disney World, and there well may be no graduation. A time of real disappointment. Now we can learn from Isaac about how to deal with disappointment. Isaac was born in 1674 in Southampton, England. And when he was born, his father was in prison. In prison, not because he had committed some terrible crime, but because he was a dissenter from the Church of England, and they had thrown him in prison. And there in Southampton, Isaac's mother took Isaac to outside the prison walls and let Isaac cry and perhaps laugh a little bit as a little little baby to let Isaac's father know that he was there and he was alive. It's a sad time. Southampton uh, is a port city in England where a few years before Isaac was born, a ship called the Mayflower launched out of Southampton. And several centuries later, uh, there was another ship that launched out of Southampton called the Titanic. 
Well, Isaac grew up there in Southampton and was a precocious child. By the age of four, he was already writing poems, doing all kinds of uh, writing about history when he was just a child. And by the age of 16, Isaac uh, was ready for college. And there was one benefactor that offered him a full scholarship to Oxford or Cambridge or whatever college that Isaac chose to go to. But Oxford or Cambridge would not admit any dissenter from the Church of England. And so Isaac went to an independent college, graduated in just three years, and at age 19 moves back home. And at the Above Bar Congregational Church, Isaac began to write a hymn every week for the worship service. And the people just loved it. Now the people in the Church of England, they went berserk because you were not to write your own hymns. Hymns in those days had to be taken directly, word for word, from the Psalms of David. And here Isaac was writing his own words based on the Psalms and other passages in the Old Testament. And so the people, the, those in the Church of England, they just could not bear it. But Isaac began to be well known. He got a position as assistant pastor. And he continued writing a hymn every week for the church service. He began to get fans. He began to get fan letters. And he got one fan letter from a young lady named Elizabeth Singer, a good musical name. And she told him in her letter how much she admired his hymns that he, she'd heard about and, and had been, become aware of, and that she wanted to come and visit with Isaac. And so she came. And when he saw Elizabeth Singer, it was love at first sight. He was smitten. And he got to the point where he decided this was the person that he was to marry. And so he asked her to marry him, and she turned him down. She said that while she admired the jewel that was his character, she just could not accept the box that contained the jewel. And Isaac didn't have much of a box. He was barely five feet tall. He had a very large head and he had a prominent nose. He wasn't a real pleasant box to look at. He was devastated. He never, ever married. And he could have gotten bitter toward God, bitter toward life, dropped out of the church, dropped out of life. He couldn't help the box that he was in. He couldn't change the box that he was in. But instead of dealing with that disappointment by getting bitter, he decided to redouble his gifts, his talents to use for the Lord. He continued writing hymns, writing sermons, writing books on astronomy and geography, poetry for children and, and prayers for children, continued working for the Lord for many years till his health failed and eventually he died at age 74. Sharon and I had the opportunity a few years ago to attend a conference in Southampton, England. They have a wonderful tradition there in Southampton because there's a large town bell tower. And four times a day, the bell tower chimes out with one of Isaac Watts' great hymns, O oh God, our help in ages past, our help for years to come, our shelter, and we hear the word shelter a lot nowadays, don't we? Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. And he based that on Psalm 90 and Psalm 91. When I came down here to Keene, as a uh, junior in academy in fall of 1962, 
Uh, there was an all-school worship every morning, Monday through Friday. College and academy, dorm and village, we met in Evans Hall. And for the all-school worship each morning, we would stand and sing Isaac Watts' great hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Now, Isaac Watts wrote other songs, too. He wrote over 700 songs. Some of the other songs that he wrote, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, and that was intended for children. At the Cross, Never Part Again. And those of you who knew the Barron Brothers remember their wonderful rendition of Never Part Again. We're marching to Zion. He wrote that at age 19. Lord in the morning, before, before Jehovah's awful throne. And when I survey the wondrous cross, and many musicians believe that when I survey the wondrous cross is the greatest hymn ever written. Now Isaac also wrote a Christmas song that you might have sung once or twice in your life. Uh, it's now been sung for about 300 years as of last year. George Frederick Handel uh, wrote the melody, but Isaac Watts is the one who wrote the words to joy to the world. Our Adventist hymnal has a lot of hymns in it, but Isaac Watts has more hymns in it than anyone else. 24. Now we are living in a time of the stormy blast, a time when there's a lot of great disappointment and loss. But we need to remember that shelter in place is probably appropriate right now, but that God is our shelter from the stormy blast. God has been our help in ages past. God is our hope for years to come. And best of all, God is our eternal home. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, I'm so thankful, Lord, that you have blessed people through the years who have dealt with disappointment. There's a lot of disappointment right now in this world, in this country, in this town. But Lord, help us to keep trusting you, that you have been our help in ages past. You're our hope for years to come. And ultimately, you are our, our eternal home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a wonderful feature for you today that I don't think will be a disappointment. Uh, Dean and Nancy Kabansug have been friends with our family for a long time. In fact, Dean uh, was one of my freshmen in, uh, here at Southwestern years ago when he was a general studies major. And I'm glad he decided not to be a general, but to go into being a doctor, and he does that well. And he married a wonderful person in Nancy, who is a dentist and also a fine keyboard person. Uh, they do their professions well, but their specialty is in raising children. And they have four wonderful children who are with us today. Uh, Tyler, who is a freshman in academy, and he is vice president of his class. And we also have Lauren, who's eighth grade, and she is president of her class and hoping there'll be a graduation exercise this year. There's also Mallory, who's seventh grade. She's not an officer because they didn't elect officers. And there's Bryce, who is in fourth grade. And he's also not an officer because they didn't elect officers in the fourth grade. But he plays cello, and the other play, three play violin, and Nancy will be accompanied on the piano uh, for this. And we have four numbers that they will be presenting. Brandenburg Concerto, Gavat, and Bryce will be doing a solo on that, a cello solo. Precious Lord, and I need thee every hour, and fairest Lord Jesus. So I'm sure you'll be blessed as we have this feature today.
Were you blessed by that? I know I was. And I want to thank uh, Tyler and Lauren and Mallory and Bryce and Nancy for sharing the gifts that God gave them today. It was a very special blessing. And I bet there were some grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and all kinds of Chapel Sabbath School friends who are also very proud of them and very blessed. Our lesson study today is given by Carl Johnston. Carl and Ella have been friends of our family for quite a number of years. In fact, for a while over at Revelation Seminar, uh, they employed our, our son who became like a son to them. They treated him like a son. And we're so glad to have Carl with us today to lead in our lesson study. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm Carl Johnston. I'm at Seminars Unlimited, Revelation Seminar, have been for a while. It's a privilege to be with you this Sabbath morning. And uh, I count it a special privilege because the last time I was here, you were all out there. And that was the last time we were all together. So this is a special time to, to be together with each other as we're apart. And, uh, you know, there are other broadcasts that have super secret guests. We have a super secret guest this morning. And usually they bring them in from all over the world, and they're on video. And we are, uh, we're not quite that high tech. We're actually low tech. But I do have a super secret guest for you, and I'm going to reveal him now. His name is Teddy Bear. Now, Teddy is a little shy, and he doesn't say much, so I've had to bring in my second super secret guest, a man that you're, needs no introduction, so I won't introduce him. No, uh, you all know him, and I've, I, we want to welcome our union president, Pastor Larry Moore. He pastored here for a number of years, and one of his specialties was communicating with the animals. Every week, he would bring a new animal. And so, uh, Pastor, would you come and, and uh, introduce us, and maybe you can get Teddy to tell us something. Well, this is Teddy Bear, and uh, when I was a pastor here at this church, I had quite a few stuffed animals. I think some of you probably will remember that. And uh, I had a, a bear, small bear, and tell stories about him as well as others. But I'm just telling you, I've been gone from here for a long time. Has Teddy grown? Teddy has grown a lot <laughs> since I was here before. If you can want to take a look at him, he's pretty healthy looking, isn't he? And uh, he was a good guy. He didn't bite me or anything. He growled a few times, but other than that, he was, he was okay. But uh, anyway, I like bears. I wish that they were a little more friendly though, Carl. Uh, where I see them, you know, in the zoo and place like that, they seem kind of tired. But if you ever encounter one of these guys out in the wild, they can be something. You know, Pastor, they are saying now that we're staying at home, the wildlife is coming out, and bears are more places than you want to know. You're exactly right, Carl. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I used to do a camp meeting at uh, Lake Tahoe in California, and um, the bears little bears would come around and try to steal that something out of your... Uh, uh, the picnic basket? Picnic basket <laughs> or out of your sleeping bag or, or something, and they would make little noises and everything, and if you heard them, it'd be good if you sought cover or something because a lot of times their mommy or their daddy was around, and because of that, they were, they were not afraid of anything. They really weren't. Doesn't the Bible say something about a she-bear robbed of her cubs? Yes, it, I believe it does. I'd have forgotten where the text is, but I believe that you're right. And uh, anytime you get close to one of these guys, even little ones, uh, they can do some damage. So uh, it's been fun over the years to uh, have that relationship with stuffed animals. But uh, I, so people ask me, well, do you still have any left? And uh, the answer to that is yes, I do. I've got quite a number of them. I've probably got 50 or 60 um, animals. And so um, is the is the Moore Zoo closed at this time for for uh, for, for, safety? Remodeling, oh, yes, for remodeling? Yes, okay. remodeling. Yes. The COVID hasn't affected it. It has not affected okay. these guys. All right. right. All right. But, but they take up a lot of room, as you see. But uh, this one here looks friendly. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here with you on Sabbath. And uh, we can enjoy our time and study Bible study, Sabbath school lesson. And um, I look forward to it. 
Well, Pastor, you know, as we look around, everything seems to be so dire and there's so much anxiety and tension. I, I thought it would be good to bring you in for a little lighter side here as we start. We're looking at a Sabbath school lesson this morning, and it's called The Bible, the Authoritative Source of Our Theology. Let's pause for prayer. Pastor, would you lead us? Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the many blessings that you've given us. Uh, Father, we thank you for animals, and we look forward to the day when uh, they'll not be afraid of us and we'll not be afraid of them. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you'll help us to be ready when Jesus comes, and may it be soon. We want to pray for all the people, Lord, that are uh, ill with the uh, virus. We pray that you'll be with them in a very special way. Uh, give them strength. Give them courage. We pray that their hopes might be rekindled again this morning as we study from your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our lesson this morning is, uh, well, we, obviously it was written by theologians, so they kind of delve into it, and it almost seems like we've been in every week has kind of been an introduction to an introduction. This is kind of a laying some of the foundation before we get into some of the more meaty parts, but let's, let's look at it. It, it. Why is it important to look at the Bible as our source of theology? And our lesson authors have pointed out five areas that could influence or do influence how we look at the Bible. You know, most churches... Uh, I don't know of too many that don't, have, don't claim some relationship to the Bible one way or another, but they often come to very different conclusions on a lot of subjects. And so uh, the authors point out that there are five areas that are important, and it's important that uh, as we look at the Bible, that the Bible draws us closer to God. After all, in Jesus' day, they had the Bible, they had the scriptures, but they rejected Jesus. And part of that reason was because of the way they approached Scripture. In fact, Jesus told them on a number of occasions where they err because they didn't know Scripture or the power of God. So if the Scripture doesn't bring you closer to God and in a closer relationship with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, then something is definitely wrong. I'm glad you mentioned that, Carl, because uh, I have wondered, I, especially when I was a young, young fellow, um, why, why was that anyway that uh, scriptures, you know, the Bible are very, very similar and different uh, translations are, are still similar. But why is it that people, uh, after they read the Bible, uh, some of them go to church on a different day. Some of them believe different things about food you should eat or not eat. And where do they get that from the from here. They come to very different conclusions, don't they? They really do. And that's what our lesson authors were trying to point out in these five areas, uh, talking about the interpretation or how you understand Scripture. And, and those areas include tradition, experience, culture, reason, and the Bible itself. So let's explore each of those areas and, and see how they would affect our understanding of the Scriptures of the Bible. That's good. Uh, before we get real into the meat of the subject, I was thinking um, about uh, a couple of different groups. Uh, one would be the Catholic Church. Their interpretation of Scripture is certainly different from Protestants' uh, interpretation of Scripture, and um, they do things differently. And um, I just know that um, uh, all of us, you know, won't see things totally the same, but we will see some things that are similar. I'm glad you point that out because that kind of brings us into our first area of tradition. And uh, tradition, when you think of tradition, you think of a lot of the liturgical churches. As you mentioned, Catholics, Orthodox, even to a certain extent Episcopalians, Presbyterians, uh, maybe even Lutherans and a, very, a, lot, of, a lot of groups that, uh, that have a, a strong liturgy or, or kind of a format that they, that they go through. Uh, tradition isn't always bad. I was getting ready to say what you, what you just said. Tradition really is not all bad. I, when I was a boy, we attended a Presbyterian church, and it was kind of high church uh, type thing, and um, I really enjoyed that, and uh, some of the things I still miss uh, because of that. So um, I'm sure maybe you're the, the same way, not being raised in, in the Adventist church, but some of those things are beautiful things. Tradition, as you say, is not all bad. Well, too, when you think about it, uh, in the societies, even until basically recently, uh, societies basically were illiterate. 
And the only way that they were taught was by tradition, by teaching. Uh, in Jesus' day, you know, you had the scribes and, and, and Pharisees, and, and they could read the scriptures, but most of the other folks uh, had to listen to them to understand what was going on. And uh, they had, you know, that's a good way of teaching and reminding. They especially were agriculturally based. So they, they would have the cycle of the seasons, the cycle of the crops, and, well, obviously the cycle of the Sabbath. That was a tradition. So tradition isn't bad unless it starts conflicting with God's Word. It drives you away from the Bible or, or pulls you away from the Bible. You're exactly right. Um, Jesus uh, was concerned about this. Uh, he believed, of course, in Scripture over tradition. But uh, I was thinking about some of the things... Even in our church now, or the Seventh Day Adventist Church, that we might consider uh, tradition. Once again, it's not all bad, but uh, things like the Sabbath. Uh, you know, we used to get up in church. We, we get up, we go to church. Uh, we may wear our suit or whatever and go to church, greet our friends. Well, we used to greet our friends. Now we don't. That's true. <laughs> but uh, we may never shake hands again. We may, may never. <laughs> Never shake hands again, but I was just thinking that's uh, that's kind of a tradition that crept into the church, uh, Sunday keeping instead of Sabbath keeping, and uh, we need to restore that, call people's attention to it. I think of another thing. When I was a little Presbyterian baby, uh, I was In baptized. Infant baptism? Infant baptism. I was baptized when I was just a baby about this long, and my mother said that I reached up and put my hand up on my head where there's no hair now, you notice. Was there hair then? There was there was no hair then. Hey, some things come full some circle, don't, don't they? Some things don't change. Some <laughs> things don't change. Anyway, um, that's all that she remembers about that, and I don't remember anything about it. But when I was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist, I can remember where it was. It was in San Antonio at the Laurel Heights Church, and, and I was excited about it. My parents were excited about it, and uh, I can still remember that... Uh, it was there uh, in November, a cold, kind of a crisp day in San Antonio. And uh, I can still remember those things about it. So baptism should be, should be administered to people that have made a decision to follow Jesus. Pastor, how do you think, how do you think tradition creeps in that, that actually eventually contradicts what the Bible actually wants us to do? I think it's slowly, Carl, because I believe that... Uh, I, you know, I, I really believe that a lot of people want to do what's right. They want to follow the scripture, but uh, things just kind of get edged off to the side. And I don't know if it was a water shortage or if it was just we're not going to do this this way anymore and decided to do it a different way. But uh, I think it comes slowly over a period of time. In, in Jesus' day and in Old Testament times, um, they were very concerned about the commandments of God about God's Word, about the, the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of, of Moses. And, uh, and they had the habit, as we kind of do, you, you kind of be, you're zealous, and then all of a sudden you kind of cool down and drift away, and you go back. And, and the whole Old Testament is a history of good king, bad king, following God, abandoning God, following idols. And uh, eventually, I think that the leadership of the church, the pastors, the, the rabbis, they would try to keep you from going, getting close to the edge. So, so they, would, they would come up with saying, okay, if we're going to keep away from that, then we'll need to do this. And so if you are, are punctilious or you, you observe the little things, you, you'll certainly observe the big things. Well, the problem came in where, where it would come to those little things started to supersede the big things and actually come into conflict. In fact, the quarterly brings out a, a situation that happened with Jesus in Mark's Gospel, the seventh chapter. It talks about the disciples were walking through, and I would picture them maybe walking through the field, or as on one occasion, or perhaps they had reached into their bag and were eating some bread, and they were chewing on it as they were hungry. As you know, it was a long day. Jesus was preaching, and the scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem came, and uh, they were good people. They were there to make sure that everybody that was teaching something wasn't teaching things that were out of harmony with God's word. And so they saw Jesus' disciples eating but they hadn't washed their hands. 
Now, in our day and culture here immediately, we would say, oh, yeah, we can identify with that. But that wasn't exactly what they were talking about. When they were talking about washing hands, they had a, this was ceremonial washing. They had a ritual, didn't they? Oh, and, and not only a ritual, they had the, the way that you had to wash, the, enough, the amount of water had to be prescribed. It was as enough as it would fit, I think, in an eggshell or maybe an eggshell and a half. Mm -hmm. and, and you had to have the water drip from the fingertips to the, to the uh, palms or maybe vice versa. I don't remember. And, and if you didn't have any water to wash, you could just do that dry cleaning, so to speak. That's true. That's so it was, the cer it was the ceremony. It had nothing to do with COVID. <laughs> it had nothing to do with germs or sanitation. It wasn't a, a thing of health. It was a thing of ceremony. So it had drifted away. I mean, it's a good idea to wash your hands when you, when you come in contact. Wash it frequently. That's what they're telling us. But uh, this was something that was completely different. And so they were ragging on Jesus through his disciples. And they often tried to do that. They couldn't they wouldn't dare attack Jesus directly because, you know, he, he turned the tables on them constantly. So they would pick on the disciples. And so Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't like that. And he said, you know, well, you know, tell me uh, the traditions. What about the tradition that you have? And he brought up something that they called was Corbin. Do you remember what the Bible said about Corbin? I remember hearing the word, Carl, but refresh my mind. Corbin was a thing that if you pronounce something Corbin, it was and it, it meant gift. It meant giving. And uh, if per, per, perhaps like your children had inherited property, and uh, this was the day before Social Security and, and, and stimulus and all those kind of things that are supposed to be coming our way, this was in those days. And if you said this is Corbin, then it was dedicated to God. It was kind of like a it was kind of like a trust, okay? And so by dedicating it to God, they they seemed pious, and that relieved them from having to do anything for their parents anymore. In fact, but they could use the property as they saw fit until they died, and then it went to the temple. Yeah. And, and so Jesus said, you have a fine way of keeping your tradition and making void the commandments of God. And then he quoted the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Carl, before we get too far from it, I would be interested in knowing what your Catholic baptism was like. Were you baptized as a Catholic as a boy or... How does that work in the Catholic? Church? Well, it's probably similar to yours, and Pastor, I have to admit, I have no, I have no, no recollection. I have no recollection of it either. So, okay. so it wasn't a, it wasn't a conscious choice, um, and and that was part of the other traditions that crept up, that were the were the actions or the ceremonies, which are good. They remind us of certain things, but the action of the ceremony became. Uh, salvif salvific, if you will, in and of itself. It, it, had, it had grace and salvation and brownie points that were associated with it or, or dire consequences. I remember them talking about when I was in school, we would put money in little banks so we could save the pagan babies. And uh, so we would send money overseas as missions and that way they could be baptized and so they wouldn't burn in hell forever or purgatory or wherever that was. Mm -hmm. So anyway, baptism's good. Uh, we're just talking about different methods. What difference does it make, Carl, whether you're baptized by immersion or whether you're baptized by sprinkling as we were? Um, what's, what, what, so wh why the difference? What, what, what is that difference does it make? Well, Pastor, how would you have felt if instead of we were talking about baptism, maybe we were talking about marriage? And maybe your folks, you know, as they, as they came to that San Antonio church, and, and I know that they, they came, you came there and you were, you were a young, young child. I was very young. Yeah, yeah. But, but you were still a child. But let's say they got there a little earlier. Let's say they got there about the time of your baptism, maybe shortly thereafter, and they met that family. They, they met that, that family that had a couple of daughters, and they said, you know, that daughter, Jeannie, I think she, I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, she would, she would make a pretty good wife, so why don't we let them get married now? Well, you know, there are some societies, by the way, that the parents arrange it and even arrange it in childhood. But, but uh, how much of a commitment do you think or how solid a commitment could that be for you if the parents made that decision oh, for you? That would, it would be kind of shaky. Uh, so I think, I think the same kind of applies because baptism isn't a doesn't convey grace in and of itself. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward conviction on that relationship that you have with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's enough said about tradition. All I right, you want, to, you want to move on? I, I want to move on, okay. but I, I like uh, where we're going because I think that uh, the Scripture uh, is our safeguard. 
Well, the second, and I'm going to jump ahead one because I think it fits, I think it fits good with, with tradition, and that's culture. Uh, what is culture? Um, culture is kind of a complex thing. In fact, I, I went to the Wikipedia to get a definition, and they say culture is a word for the way of life of groups of people, meaning the way they do things. Different groups may have different cultures. A culture is passed down to the next generation by learning, whereas genetics are passed down by heredity. Culture is seen in people's writing, religion, music, clothes, cooking, and in what they do. Now, there are a couple of definitions that kind of uh, dovetail off of that. Uh, culture is very complicated, it says. The word has many meanings. The word culture is most commonly used in three ways, it says. Excellence of taste. You know, if you say somebody has culture, they have culture. Uh, in fine arts and humanities, also known as high culture. Okay, or it's an integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior. Now, that's probably what we're looking at in our definition today. Yeah, and Carl, could you use that to do what you want to do? You say, oh, this, it's, this is my culture to do it this way. Well, perhaps if it really is. Now, oftentimes it becomes a smokescreen or an excuse. And let me look at the, the third area that it mentions. It says it's the outlook the attitudes, the values, the morals, the goals, the customs that are shared by society. Mm -hmm. So you might, you might consider it uh, hab the habits of society. And uh, some of the ways that bring out the differences of culture are in relationship to weddings. And so I happened to Google some of the things on weddings and some very, you know, you performed a lot of weddings. Uh, yes, I did. In fact, right here in this Keene Church. Right, maybe Quite even in here. Or is this the place where we perform the other thing that we do? Uh, yeah, you mean funerals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. we won't go into did, did that. A few of those. Let, let's leave that alone. Yeah. But uh, everyone is familiar with the wedding staples, tossing the bouquet, the first dance. Yeah, how'd that get started? I don't it? know totally, and we don't have time for that yet, Pastor, but I wanted okay. to show a few of those things that are a little different than what we're used to, and you'd be surprised if okay. that happened in one of the wedding series enlighten that you were doing. Me, enlighten me. Okay, have you, ever, have you ever imagined slaughtering a chicken <laughs> or marrying a banana tree? Uh, it says, check out these wild traditions, and, and you can Google them here a little later, but uh, it's called, in Scotland, they call the blackening of the bride. The bride and groom are slathered together, head to toe, in every disgusting substance their friends can find. Curdled milk, rotten eggs, spoiled curry, fish sauces, flour, sausages. Uh, oh, wait a minute, Carl, 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 back the train up a moment. You're saying they do this pre-wedding, It's right? part of the service. <laughs> it's part of the service. Well, I'm glad we never did that here. Yeah, depending on the region, sometimes or just the bride and the groom alone, who is the victim of the particular wedding tradition. Hmm. Now, there's another, there's, another, uh, there's another tradition. 30 days before the wedding, the, the bride spends an hour a day crying. And then 10 days later, she's joined by her mother. I would and be then wondering 10 if days it would later be the by groom her crying. I would be wondering if it was the groom that would be crying. Well, a actually, it's meant as a, as, as a sign of joy and deep love. And then in Mongolia and China, they, uh, they have to slaughter a chicken to find a perfect chicken liver. Uh, in India, uh, in, for instance, there's certain days that, that are good, better days than others to be married. Uh, in Malaysia, after the wedding, the bride and groom are, are shut up, kind of like uh, self-quarantined, mm. and they're not allowed to go to the bathroom. I mean, the, for how long? I mean, Carl, three days. Let's, let's be, three days. Let's, let's be real, uh, uh, hey, realistic it's tough. here. It's tough. There wow. is in, in Kenya, in the Maasai Nation, there's a there's a habit where the where the father of the bride would spit on the bride. Uh, in uh, Sweden, and this is a better one. In Sweden, if the groom leaves for any reason, all the other men at the wedding are allowed to kiss the bride. And if the if the, uh, the same also for the groom if, for the female guest. So so there are a number of things are a number of things that that we would look at as very strange, uh, but those are all part of the culture and they grew up in various reasons, various traditions. Uh, culture is basically the way that a society does things. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, you know uh, we would we would shake hands upon meeting folks. Well, we won't do that anymore. Now I guess we we knock elbows. Yeah. But in, in Oriental societies, there's bowing. Uh, so there's a lot of things in culture, and that, that enters into worship service. It's not necessarily bad, but I'll tell you what, you have been pastor long enough and administration long enough to know that a lot of culture creates a lot of disruption. It really does. And, and Carl, wouldn't you say that uh, they would find our 
cultural uh, activities probably a little strange too. I remember when I got married, we had a nice uh, car to start off with, and somebody tied a bunch of tin cans on the back of it and put them back under the car. So when I took off, I thought my engine was falling out. <laughs> now that's strange. I mean, why in the world would you do that? Well, better than it putting up on blocks, right? When you tried to take it off. It would be, right? It would be. <laughs> and the rice and the and all the, the various, yeah, all, yeah. So there's a lot of influence that has culture. And, you know, people remember things of culture. We recently celebrated Easter. And we talked about some of the liturgical, uh, the liturgical churches yeah. that have certain rituals that are associated with Easter, the dying of eggs and the, and the Easter from, bunnies. Uh, well, you know, the Easter bunny, actually, I found out this year, came from Germany. Oh, really? And, and uh, so that was a German tradition. Again, there's a lot of things that we could Google and go through and, and see some of these things. But I like the bumper sticker that I saw recently. It's about the lamb and not the rabbit. Ah, okay, I like that. Let's move on to another area. Let's go on to our another section, and that's reason. Reason. Uh, what do you, when we're talking about reason, what do you, what do you think, Pastor, that, that, what, what does that connotate when you think about reason? Well, you know, I, I like to be reasonable myself. Uh, I find people all around that like to uh, be reasonable themselves, but that means to them that you should do it their way or the highway. And uh, it enters into religion also because some of these folks reason their way out of certain things that they're not familiar with and don't believe that uh, it matters or it makes any difference. But you know, as you think about reason and reasoning something in your mind or in your brain, uh, after you've reasoned for a while, a lot of time the act follows it. If you're thinking about shooting somebody, or that, that's kind of that's unreasonable for, for isn't Sabbath it? school. That's unreasonable. But um, people do it. They think they have a reason to do it, and so they do it, but it's the wrong thing to do. From a theological perspective, uh, the lesson authors point out that in liberal theology, and this is higher criticism, uh, they have come to the place where if they can't establish it through science, if they can't establish it through experimentation, they totally reject it as, as being a myth. So they have come to the, they can take that to the extreme where you get rid of the creation, you get rid of the resurrection, you get rid of the miracles, you get rid of the healings, uh, and actually you come to the place where you, uh, well, you, oftentimes you see on PBS they have a number of specials and they talk about how man invented religion. Mm. And so we have invented God after our own image and what we think God can do or can't do and we've kind of put God in a box. Carl, wasn't there something in the Sabbath school lesson about a a president or a statesman or something that uh, decided he would cut all of the supernatural things Tom, out of Scripture. Thomas Jefferson. Ah, yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Now, what happened to the, uh, you know, I can imagine his Bible being like this and then being now Pretty like this. Pretty soon you just have the covers. What do you have? You, you don't have you anything. Have. And you have what man thinks about it rather than what God has revealed to us. Well, you know, and that is probably the cornerstone of most non-Judaic, non-Christian religions, and that is man looking after God. We try to appease God. I like the, uh, you, I, I, talk, I see a lot of commercials because commercials are the practical mo marketing and psychology that, that these folks appeal to us on. And uh, this commercial is a, is a commercial and, and these folks are, are coming up to the top of the mountain. You see a volcano in the, in the background and the guy steps up and says, okay, what's going on here? He says, well, he says, uh, you see the volcano, you jump in, the rain comes back, and uh, we're all happy. He said, well, couldn't we just do something else, like maybe invent something that we could go over to the river like with tubes and, and bring them over and water the crops that way? He said, yeah, but we're all here, and we hear a voice in the background, let's get on with it. Okay, and he jumps into the volcano. Uh, you know, we, we don't invent religion to make us feel better. God is the one that revealed to us his plan for us. In and the Bible. In the Bible. Right. And that's really important. Well, time is still moving along even without the folks here, Pastor. Let's go down to the next one I'd like to talk Carl, about. Carl, let uh, me ask you a question, though, first. Go ahead. Uh, you and I did an evangelistic meeting. We did a number of them. We did a number of them. And I remember the ones in Phoenix because we were both living in Phoenix at the time. And uh, you were doing evangelism. I was pastoring a church. And we did several evangelistic meetings. 
And I remember one young lady that came to our meetings. And uh, when we were out uh, on a night other than when we were having a meeting, we stopped by her house and we asked her how she was enjoying the meetings. And uh, she said, I have been searching for this all of my life. I will never forget that because uh, we were able to, you were able to open to her the scriptures, the Bible. It was what she had been looking for all of her life. She was happy when that happened. And um, there's just multitude and, and millions of stories like that and there's people all over the world that are looking for something better right now we got especially this especially especially now especially now they're looking and uh, what a terrible thing to waste an opportunity like that one if we if we were to do it well maybe you know as, as jesus predicted there before jerusalem fell there was a little interim where miraculously the the roman troops backed off and and the christians were able to to escape the city you know, maybe this, this virus will back off and we'll have opportunity to make, to make hay to, in order to take advantage of the opportunity. We don't know, but God has it all under control, doesn't he? Is this, yes, he does. Is this terrible thing predicted in the Bible? Well, I don't know about this thing in particular, but it does say that, that times are not going to be easy. That's right. And, uh, you know, I like, to, I like to think of Jesus' words. Jesus said, I told you these things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you will believe and know that I am He. Amen. So there may, the, the predictions and prophecies, not so much to make us little prophets and know exactly where the timeline is and when to run to the hills. Jesus gives us prophecy that as we see those prophets, prophecies come to pass, we have even more confidence in His leading. And before we leave reason, one thing I want to say, we don't want to leave reason with the impression it's all bad. Because no. in the Bible, constantly, Jesus gives us, in fact, I think of Isaiah, where God says, come now, let us reason, reason. together. Yeah. And then Jesus, in the, in the Gospels, would often talk to the disciples and say, Peter, what do you think? Uh, or how do you read? So we are to use our reason, but our reason, if our reason leads us away from God, that reason is unreasonable. Exactly. It, needs to, it should lead us to Scripture, and we should need to become familiar with Scripture. And, and it's like you say, and that's that reason is not all, always bad. In Let, fact, it can be good. I'd like to kind of finish with experience. And uh, experience is important. Now, the uh, lesson author points out that there are some individuals that experience trumps everything. If, uh, if it, even if it's clear in the Bible, uh, you remember in some of those evangelistic meetings we'd, walk to, we'd go to people and why they wouldn't say it exactly this way, it's like, don't bother me with the facts when my mind is made yeah. up. Okay. So uh, experience and individuals, in, in, and they talk typ typically about charismatic and Pentecostal, where, where experience can lead you to be in direct contradiction to Bible truth and what the Holy Spirit would lead you. So if it is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and it's very important, the Holy Spirit is not going to lead you in opposition to what he has inspired his men, his women, to write in scriptures. Carl, can, can someone use uh, experience to uh, do what they want to do and take them away from scripture uh, for their own uh, means? In other words, they, they may say something like, you know, the Spirit told me to do this. And uh, maybe they really believe it, that the Holy Spirit did, but it, it's contrary to Scripture. What do you do with somebody like that? Well, you know, the Bible does say that there'll be false prophets and false spirits, that we should try them, but they're to be tried and tested by the, by the Word by of the God. Word of God. And the only, I think, Pastor, you know, we've had so much experience with that that you can't argue. The only thing that you can do is pray for those individuals and, and do what you can. And we've seen many individuals later on that would, would turn around. Mm -hmm. uh, one aspect of experience, too, would be uh, perhaps how you relate to your parents. You know, the psychologists tell us that uh, the early impressions that you have of God are often made up by the, the impressions that you have of, as a child of your parents. Now, I think of, interesting, I just observed this here recently uh, with my wife. Ella prays with her. You can't, you can't call Seminars Unlimited without Ella praying for you when we're done. She will always do that. In fact, I think you even had us get the phone number 1-800-CALL-ELLA. <laughs> uh, but I, when Ella starts her prayer, she'll, she'll start her prayer, Loving Father. Now, interestingly enough, they had a very, very 
tight family. Uh, they weren't perfect, but they were kind of the little house on the prairie kind of family. Now, I grew up in a completely different, different situation, yeah. and so when I pray, I start out, I caught myself, Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite as personal, but, you know, it's similar. Uh, so it, it can be, it can be uh, influenced by your experience. Um, and I'd like to maybe close with an experience that we've had here coming to Keene. Yes. You know, we came a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. We were teaching the ninth quarter in the Northwest, North Pacific. And, uh, when and what is they the ninth quarter, Carl? The ninth quarter is you teach seminary students. Seminary after, students. after they come out of the seminary, yeah. we help them to integrate back to their churches, especially in, in, involved in helping them to, to feel comfortable in evangelism. And so we were doing that for a number of years. A call came. We came to, we, we accepted the call to come to Texas. We had to finish the ninth quarter, and, and it was wintertime. And uh, they don't get a lot of snow in Seattle, but things were closing up. Things were freezing. And Elle and I had our travel trailer in our car, and we were traveling down to down Highway 5 to come to Texas and, and get to California. And they were closing the highway behind us, so we had to keep going. And, and uh, as we were going along, if we could only get to California, if we could only get to... Well, we got to California and couldn't get over the mountain passes. Hmm. And uh, one of the things that was a particular irritation for me was the fact that I had lost a reflector on the travel trailer. <laughs> And, and, you know, it didn't seem like a big deal, but it was a little deal. And, and we were stopping quite frequently with, for gas every so often at the truck stops. And they had all kinds of reflectors, but they didn't have what I needed. They were either red or round. or They, they weren't exactly what I needed. And so finally we got over the, we got over the Tehachapi Pass, and we were coming on, on through the desert there outside of Barstow. And there's nothing out there, as you kind of know. That was kind of your territory. That's right. And uh, so I, I stopped there in the middle of the desert. I'm not sure why. And, and what was weighing on my mind is how can I get to seminars? How can I? And in the meantime, too, by the way, while we were traveling, they said, hey, we just fired the third director. Would you please be the director? And something possessed us and said yes at the moment. But, but anyway, <laughs> I, and, uh, and they told us that we're thousands of dollars in debt. And I'm thinking, I can't even find a little reflector. <laughs> how in the world are we going to lead this ministry? So we stopped there in Barstow. I walk around the back of the uh, back of the trailer. I kicked the tires. That's what I saw the truckers do, you know. And I went back and said hey to Ella and kissed her. And and I'm walking back along the other side. And I look out there in the desert. Oh, about it here to the back row. And something catches my eye, a reflection. And I walk over and I walk over and I pick it up. I think I know where this story is going, don't you? I, I've told it before, but I wanted to get it on tape. I, I think. love this story. And, and I walked over and picked it up. It wasn't red. It was amber. It wasn't uh, round. It was just what I needed. I walked over, picked it up, went over to the side of the trailer. Perfect fit. Perfect fit. Is that it right there? That, well... A reasonable facsimile. Like okay, the, original, right. the original is in the museum. Okay, all right. But this is a reasonable facsimile that I grabbed. Great at the, story. Great and, story. And, you know, from that point on, I, in fact, I have it on top of my dresser, and I have this one in my office. And mm -hmm. whenever Monday comes and you want to leave the keys on the table, yeah. you look at that and say, and the Lord, the Lord, I have a text in Isaiah. It says, before they call, I will I, answer. I will answer. Yeah. And while they are yet speaking... Yeah. And so experience can not only lead us away from God, but experience God gives us. And we almost need these daily. God gives us these experiences that draw us closer to him. Yeah. Carl, I love this story. Every time I see a truck now fly by, I'm going to look for those reflectors. You look for the me of your story. Pastor, would you close with prayer for us? Be happy to, yes. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the truth that you've allowed to shine in our pathway. Uh, Father, we thank you that uh, the Bible is our rule of faith and practice. And we just pray that uh, you'll help us to continually uplift Scripture. Father, because we want to uh, be in heaven with you someday, and we want thousands and millions of others to be there also. Amen. So we know that you will bless and that you will help. Father, once again, this... Uh, uh, COVID-19 thing is a, a tough thing to face, and many people have died because of it, and we just pray that you'll um, be with those that are afflicted with it or those that might become afflicted with it. Father, thank you for the Sabbath school lesson today. Thank you for the Sabbath, and we will continue to praise you, Heavenly Father, for all that you do for us. We love you, and we want to see you soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're glad to be with you. Stay safe. Virtual, hand, virtual handshake. <laughs> Wash your hands. Sing happy birthday and pray. God bless. Happy Sabbath.